We come now not merely to message six and not merely the final message of a conference, but a message that is our arriving at the goal of all that has preceded us in the first five messages. The revelation that the dry land that emerged out of the water in Genesis typifies the resurrection life of Christ, the resurrected Christ as the source of life. Then we saw the aspects of the all-inclusive Christ typified by the good land and the meaning of milk and honey. And then we considered a rather difficult matter, a difficult chapter, I would say, concerning the covenant God made with Abraham concerning the good land. And let's keep this in mind because it will be helpful when we go through the first section of the outline. That God made a covenant with Abraham concerning the good land. The good land typifies the all-inclusive Christ. And soon we will see from a verse in Galatians that the reality of the all-inclusive Christ typified by the land of Canaan is Christ as the life giving spirit. And so we realize that we need to be partners of Christ. We have Christ as the messenger, the angel sent from God to bring us into himself. And now he needs partners. Today's Caleb's and the way is wide open to any brother or sister can pray, Lord, for the sake of your interests, for your move on the earth, for the experience and enjoyment of Christ, for the building up of the church as the body of Christ, for fighting the battle in the body against the enemy. Lord, make me a Caleb. And then in message five, we considered a particular aspect of the battle that is portrayed in the book of Joshua. And we emphasized the significance, spiritually speaking, of all the pagan tribes. And after all of this, we come to experiencing Christ as the reality of the good land promised to Abraham. So this is primarily a personal matter. We each have a, a portion and allotment of the all-inclusive Christ. We need to experience Christ we can experience Christ as the riches of the good land promised to Abraham. And then, quite a lengthy second part of the subject, laboring on the land to produce the riches of Christ for our personal enjoyment and to have a surplus to bring to the church meetings for the corporate worship of God. So now we come to Roman number one. And before I read the point, I'd like to read Galatians 3:14. But I think it would be helpful to read verse 13 first. 
Christ has redeemed us out of the curse of the law, having become a curse on our behalf, because it is written, Cursed is everyone hanging on a tree. In order that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Our wise, sovereign, omniscient God knew that all of us were under the curse of the law. The law, when applied to sinners, to us, is really a curse to us. But God sent his Son, the Christ, to redeem us out of the curse of the law. How could he do this? The righteous requirements of the law had to be fulfilled. This is absolutely necessary. God could not just set aside his awareness of all of our sins and say, I love you, I forgive you, everything is fine. His expression of love must be based on his righteousness. And righteousness required that those who disobey the law must die. So we were under the curse of the law and sentenced to spiritual death. But Christ redeemed us out of the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse on our behalf. And then Paul applies this verse from Deuteronomy. Cursed is everyone hanging on a tree. During the second three hours, Christ was on the cross. He had been made a curse for us. He took the curse upon himself so that we might receive the blessing so that we might be able to enter into the all-inclusive Christ typified by the land of Canaan, to have our allotted portion, to experience and enjoy this wonderful all-inclusive Christ. And so Christ died as a, under the curse being a curse in order that the blessing of Abraham, the promise of the good land, might come to the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. And how do we receive this promise? Which is the promised land typifying Christ and which for us is the all-inclusive Christ himself, as the Spirit, we receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. My beloved brothers and sisters, what a price Christ paid so that we may enter into himself as the reality of the good land, experience him, enjoy him, live him, be constituted with him, praise him, praise our Lord for redeeming us by becoming a curse. 
And we thank and worship God the Father who suffered when his son was suffering. Thank you for sending forth your only begotten son to become a curse for us so that the blessing of Abraham and that blessing was confirmed and secured by the covenant. Now to all those who are in Christ Jesus, and we have believed into Christ, we have been baptized into Christ. Right now as we're meeting, we are in Christ. Now we can receive the promise, Christ as the reality of the good land by receiving the Spirit through faith. Even the faith is Christ infused into us. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. And now we don't look for a feeling. We don't exercise any kind of willpower to make something happen. We simply, by the faith dispensed into us, receive the Spirit as the reality of Christ, who is the reality of the good land, the land of Canaan, as the highest type of the all-inclusive Christ. And this opens the way for us to experience the all-inclusive Christ because he is now in us as the Spirit. The Spirit is the all-inclusive, process and consummated triune God in Christ to be the life-giving Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And on our part, we exercise our spirit not only to be one with the Lord, but to contact Him in the midst of all kinds of situations throughout the day. We contact Him by exercising our spirit and we receive more and more of the Spirit, the reality of Christ, who is the reality of the type, the all-inclusive Christ, our good land. Now I can read this part of the outline, and uh, I hope and I, I believe it will be becoming clearer. Galatians 3.14 is an extremely important verse because it combines the promise of the Spirit with the blessing of Abraham. This verse indicates that the Spirit is the blessing that God promised to Abraham for all the nations, and, and that has been received by the believers through faith in Christ. And here we have verses promising the blessing from Genesis. One, God's promise to Abraham was repeated to his son and to his grandson. In Galatians 3, Paul interprets the good land as the blessing of the Spirit. The Old Testament promise was of the good land. The good land typifying the all-inclusive Christ. But in the New Testament, the fulfillment of the promise 
becomes the spirit. I want to read that again. The Old Testament promise was of the good land. And the good land typifies the all-inclusive Christ. So we have believed into the all-inclusive Christ. Of God, we are in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1.30 says. Now we are in Christ as the good land. How do we experience this? How does this become real to us? in all of our human day-by-day -day situations. We experience Christ, the all-inclusive Christ, as the fulfillment of the type of the land of Canaan by receiving the Spirit, by breathing in the Spirit, by drinking the Spirit, by receiving spirit and life as we pray with the word of God. We exercise our spirit to receive the spirit who is the reality of the all-inclusive Christ, who is the reality of the typology. Point B. The physical aspect of the blessing that God promised to Abraham was the good land, which was a type of the all-inclusive Christ. This is a basic truth that I believe is being just written on our heart. <clears throat> See, since Christ is eventually realized, as the all-inclusive, life-giving spirit, the blessing of the promised spirit corresponds with the blessing of the land promised to Abraham. The spirit whom we have received is the good land. Praise the Lord. How available the good land, the all-inclusive Christ, is to us. The spirit we receive is the good land. The spirit we receive is the all-inclusive Christ as the reality of the good land. <clears throat> Two, the good land is in us, and it is where we live and walk. So Christ is in us. Christ is the good land. The good land is in us. But of God, we are in Christ. Even Paul told the saints in Thessalonica when he addressed the church of the Thessalonians in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just the church is represented here. Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, Miami, Atlanta, so many other places. You not only as an individual believer are in Christ, the church where you are, the church where you meet, is in the good land. The whole church is in the all-inclusive Christ as the good land. 
And so, Christ is in us. So, so many aspects day by day of the all-inclusive Christ as the good land are being dispensed into us, wrought into us, built into us. There, we are being permeated and saturated with Christ as the land, received as the spirit. Then, then we need to learn to live and walk in the spirit as the good land. D, actually, the spirit as the realization of Christ in our experience is the good land as the source of God's bountiful supply for us to enjoy. I hope the light is beginning to shine little by little to see how wonderful is this one verse, Galatians 3.14. And now what we've been learning through the years, what came forth in this conference concerning Christ as our good land, the all-inclusive Christ, now the way is open for us to experience him by receiving the Spirit. Like that hymn says, 255. Breathe, Lord. Bre I breathe you in. Just simple. An inward calling on the Lord. Lord Jesus. And breath by breath, we are inhaling an aspect of the all-inclusive Christ. And this leads us to the second section of the message. In our daily life, we need to labor on the all-inclusive Christ as our good land for our personal supply and enjoyment. In our daily life, we need to labor on the all-inclusive Christ as our good land for our personal supply and enjoyment. And we will see in message three, this is also for the church meetings for the worship of God the Father. In December of 1962, almost all of us are familiar with this fact, Brother Lee had a conference on the all-inclusive Christ. Almost 59 years ago, And in that book, published as a book, chapter 15, Brother Lee helps us to understand what it means to live in Christ as the good land. And we have a picture of this with the people of Israel. Once they entered into the good land, defeated the enemies and settled down in their portion of the land, their major responsibility was to labor on the land, to produce a harvest, a crop of many different things in order to have both the vegetable life and the animal life. So they labored on the land to produce a harvest. They had produce. And most of the produce, the harvest, was 
for their own life supply and enjoyment. But a special portion was required of them to go to the yearly feasts and bring that portion from your labor, signifying the Christ we labor on, you need to bring together corporately and offer to God for his enjoyment and share with one another for our mutual enjoyment. You'll remember how I emphasized the fact, at least somewhat, that I began to consider after all these years, why does God inspire the writers of the Bible to use this expression, a land flowing with milk and honey? What is a land flowing with milk and honey? And by the Lord's mercy and grace, and in response to prayers of faithful saints, and in the leading of the Spirit inwardly and the anointing, I just began to search and study. And the result, what came forth, was a portion of a message on how we experience and enjoy Christ as our redeeming life and generating life to make us milk and honey people. Now, in the same principle, I began to consider afresh this expression, labor on Christ. Labor on Christ. And we have lines and songs and hymns about this. But I just wonder what would happen this is not a training, so this would not happen, but let's just think about it. Let's say right now, I would pause in the message and ask you all to do the same one thing. And that is, I am about to ask you a question. And your assignment is to write a one-sentence answer to the question. So this is not a class in the training. It's not a training. So the question is, what does it mean to labor on Christ? Labor. What does it mean? And the word labor is kind of a strong synonym for work. But it's a more demanding work, a more weighty work. And maybe this still happens in some places on the earth when a criminal has been convicted by a judge or jury and the judge sentences him or her to 10 years of hard labor. So he won't be or she won't be sitting at a desk um, just doing some simple tasks. This will be strenuous physical labor. I'm not saying that laboring on Christ is strenuous, but there's a reason that brotherly use this word labor. And this is a daily labor, a day by day, all day long labor. 
if we are really to reap the produce of the good land, to have a harvest, to truly experience and enjoy this all-inclusive Christ, then we'll see toward the end what kind of church meetings we would have. Point A says, after we enter into and possess the all-inclusive Christ as our good land, we need to labor on Christ. A proper life in the good land is a life in which we are continually laboring on Christ. Wow, what a statement. Okay, now we're in the good land. We are. We can't be lazy. We can't just relax and say, wow, how wonderful to be here. Well, you're, we're here for a reason. To produce a crop, a harvest, to meet our need. And to meet God's desire for true worshipers and real worship. And to build up the church as the house of God, the temple. And to be in the reality of the kingdom, the city. To bring the Lord back. It's a serious failure to be idle to be spiritually passive and idle. A proper life in the good land is a life in which we are continually laboring on spirit. And it's at this point I want to share with you what I've been learning from three sources, from the scriptures, from Brother Lee's ministry and from the indwelling spirit with the word. Okay, let's just keep in mind what we learned or beginning to learn from Galatians 3.14. That Christ is typified by the good land. In reality, he himself is the all-inclusive Christ. For our experience and enjoyment in God's economy, he has become the all-inclusive, life-giving spirit, the spirit. So this opened up, this opened up the spiritual realm a little more. Then, on my part, I must use my spirit. I must exercise my spirit to contact the Lord Spirit, who is the all-inclusive Christ, the good land. And this is implied by continually laboring on Christ, inwardly, continually exercising our spirit. Okay, we're not way back in Egypt, just partaking of the lamb, and then making our exit. We're no longer feeding on manna given free from heaven. We're in our portion of Christ as the good land. And our responsibility is to labor on this. 
if we do not, if day after day, week after week, months, years, decades, in our daily life, taking care of all kinds of necessary things, if we are spiritually idle and passive, we are losing one opportunity after another. So when we come to a meeting, I'm anticipating the last section. We're empty-handed, spiritually speaking. And it was a requirement of the people in Israel that they not appear before God at the feast empty-handed. They must have something to offer that is the produce of their labor. And the best part of that produce is brought to Jerusalem and offered to God as food to him. And that's a picture of our Christian life and church life right there. This is not a training. As the Lord will and guides, a message will be given in the upcoming Itero on our need to labor on Christ as the good land and to exhibit Christ and bring the surplus of Christ to every church meeting. And so here is the key point. How can I labor on Christ day by day in the midst of all kinds of situations? I'm in my car, stuck in traffic. I have some rather serious health symptoms. A dear brother who's a physician takes me to the ER. They find reason for me to stay in the hospital for a while. And I'm lying on a bed. Was hooked up to this machine. What will I do inwardly? And I just want to share something with you. And I believe you will realize what I will share is not limited to me. For your learning and even for your eventual encouraging, I have missed and lost in the 55 years I've been in the recovery. Thousands upon thousands of opportunities to labor on Christ. Why? Because the way to labor on Christ is to exercise our spirit inwardly while we are just doing what we need to do in our daily life, on our job, at home, with our family, whatever it is. We need to learn this. It will not help and it will not please God for us to make excuses. I made no excuse. But I want to learn. And I want you to guide me and train me to stop wasting time at a red light because the eight cars in front of me were too slow to turn on the green arrow. No, I'm here for three, three minutes maybe. Here's an opportunity again and again to labor on Christ as the good land. The spirit is to exercise our spirit to be one with the Lord inwardly while we're using 
the faculties of our soul and our physical body to carry out our responsibilities. And the Lord whom we are contacting, he knows what we need. And he knows what aspect of his all-inclusiveness he wants to dispense into us and work into us. This is my present understanding of laboring on Christ. Now we continue reading. Point two, everything of the life in the good land is a Christ who is related to us. It's not just something that's, we just, what, what a lovely view. What we see, the portion allocated, is Christ for us. He is for us. He's our portion. And so, point, little point A says, he is not merely an objective Christ, but altogether a subjective Christ. My dear wife faithfully prepares three meals for me a day, always healthy and pleasant to take. And she says, Ron, it's ready to eat. And everything, the food is there on the table. It's objective food. I might appreciate it, but I don't live by that. I'm not nourished by that. I'm not supplied by that. That objective food must become subjective food in me. And so, I just take it in. This is a simple picture of the subjective Christ. May I ask you rather directly, first to brothers, brothers, when, when, in your life as a Christian and as a brother in the church life, when will the objective Christ daily become your subjective Christ? If we have worked diligently all day, and sometimes it has to be over time, there's a sense at the end of the day as we now can rest. This is what I accomplished today. Now I need to rest, but there's a sense of accomplishment. I believe the Lord as our shepherd wants us to have spiritually, an inner sense like this, when we put our head on our pillow, Lord, this day was not in vain. I have more of you in me than when I woke up early this morning. Beloved saints, when will this happen to all of us? Let's all learn together. Let's go on together. <clears throat> Small b, he is a Christ labored upon by us. A Christ who is produced by us and a Christ who is enjoyed by us. When we are exercising our spirit inwardly to contact the Lord in the midst of of our daily living, we are laboring on Christ. And we will realize eventually Christ is being produced in us. And then we will enjoy the Christ produced by our labor. Point three, 
we should labor diligently on Christ so that we may experience and enjoy his all-inclusive riches. B. God has brought us into Christ and has given Christ to us as our portion. We all have a portion. Christ is our portion as our inheritance, just as the good land, just as the land of Canaan was to the children of Israel. We may not know really what the portion is, what it includes. We just sense a portion of Christ has been measured, allocated to us by God for us to labor on this portion of the all-inclusive Christ. There is no portion that is not of the all-inclusive Christ. And it's a portion for lifelong experiencing and enjoying. God has given Christ as, quote, as, quote, lots to us as our portion. Each of us has a portion of Christ. And now we have to labor on the portion of Christ given to us. Christ to enjoy him day by day. The labor on the portion of Christ given to us is given to us to be the Christ we enjoy day by day. God, spiritually speaking, little a, God will send rain, living water. God will send sunshine, just pleasant sunshine to cause us to have a rich harvest. While we're exercising our spirit, God is active. He's active. He is sending rain. He does not want us to, to be dry. This is not a hurricane, thunderstorm. It's just the rain we need. And then the sunshine. And the rain and the sunshine cause us to have a rich harvest. That a mother feeds her children, but she cannot cause them to grow. Her laboring doesn't directly cause them to grow, but her labor to supply the healthy, nourishing food is given to the children. They take it in. And then there's a law of life that works to digest the food and to cause growth in life. Then we will have riches on which to live. So actually we're laboring together with God. We are laboring, but he supplies what we need. He knows always what we need at this moment. Maybe two hours later, your need will be different. He knows. He's for us. This is pleasing to him to see we're learning to labor on the all-inclusive Christ. Little be our rich harvest and rich life will give glory to God. That means God will be expressed. Now, more of God can be expressed in us because Christ is our harvest, our rich life, more Christ in us, more glory to God, more expression to God. 
point four. If we do not labor on Christ, we cannot have a proper living as the people of God because we will have nothing on which to live. Let's just pause and consider this. Are there not hundreds of us hearing this word right now have to admit to ourselves many, many days beyond number. I didn't really have a proper Christian living. I was a good person. My boss and my job respects me. My spouse, my children honor me. My conscience testifies that you're good. You didn't sin today. You didn't love something in the world today. Then how do we live? just by our natural human life to be the best person we can. But no laboring on Christ. And so we have nothing with which to live the Christian life. Of course, we begin our daily Christian life by being with the Lord through the word at the beginning of the day. That we need to contact him. We need to be revived. So this gives us the supply to begin. But after that time, if we just live like an unbeliever in the sense that we're just living by our natural life, by our capacity in our mind, our will, emotion, what we've learned, what we've been trained to do. We're being good persons, ethical, moral, but not God men. Five, shows us more how inwardly we can labor on Christ. We labor on Christ as the good land by exercising our heart to have faith in the Lord and to love the Lord. And by exercising our spirit to contact the Lord and receive the dispensing of the all-inclusive life-giving spirit, the reality of Christ as the good land. Now let me go through this again. We have ample time. What are we doing and what do we want to be doing so that we are really laboring on Christ? This is altogether inward. I would point out that when the Lord gave us a simple illustration of living believers being raptured live, In Matthew 24, for instance, two women are grinding, kind of ordinary, even maybe boring work. And two men are in the field, meaning the area of where they work from morning to evening. And both women are believers 
Both of the men are believers. But one of the women is taken, the other left. One of the men is taken, the other left. Why? This is meaning more and more to me, brothers and sisters, than ever before. The Lord did not say, if you want to be an overcomer, a living overcomer, and be raptured just before the great tribulation begins, then you need to learn inwardly to be one with me, to let contact me, to labor on me, to experience me, to enjoy me, while you are working and taking care of your responsibilities. Okay, the two women, they're both sisters. But why does the Lord take one? He's not biased in any way. It's because, and we simply don't know what the rapture call will be like. It won't be a trumpet. Everyone can hear. Surely something inward. The one who is in contact with the Lord, laboring on the Lord by exercising her spirit as she's grinding out milk. And somehow she has the sense. Come. And immediately she responds, and she's gone. But the other woman, the other sister, has a very different situation in her inner being. Who knows what her mind is working on, what her feeling is, what's going through her soul, the natural life while she's grinding out grain. Same with the two men. They're just diligently working on their job. And some of them have significant responsibilities, but all have some tasks they have to perform. But one of the brothers is exercising his spirit to be one with the Lord and contact the Lord as he's working in this part of his living. The other is not. And so I don't want to just live in a dream and a hope, Lord. Lord, look at the world situation. Does this indicate we're drawing near to the end? May some of us, even if we're older, Maybe we will live until the beginning of the Great Tribulation. I don't want to be here during the Tribulation. I want to be one of those in Revelation 14. Well, I think the Lord is glad to hear that. But what is my responsibility? To inwardly contact the Lord in the midst of our whatever situation we're in. This is possible. Brother Nee did it. Brother Lee did it. Sister Lee did it. Other saints have done it. And the Lord can make us the same kind of laboring believers. And so... But the first thing we do is exercise our heart by turning the heart to the Lord every day. Because the Spirit is the inner man of the heart. And so we turn our heart to the Lord and exercise our heart. What? To have faith in the Lord and to love the Lord. Right now, inwardly, let's pause and just exercise our heart. Our heart is the believing organ, the loving organ. Lord, 
Lord, I still don't see you, but I love you, Lord. I love you with fresh new love. Dear beloved Lord Jesus, how precious you are, I love you. And I've never seen you. The time will come, I will, but not now. But I believe in you. I believe in your person. I believe in your work. I believe your word. Then we are able to exercise our spirit to contact the Lord. And then inwardly we receive the dispensing of the all-inclusive life-giving spirit. The reality of Christ as the good land. It may be when you hear this, deep within, you say, Amen, you agree. But maybe you join the vast majority who wonder, how do I experience this? How can this become my living? And we have no methods. There's no forms, formalities. I would simply ask you, encourage you, turn to your teacher, the Lord Jesus, and say, Lord, teach me, train me to labor on you every day for the rest of my life. Lord, train me, remind me, guide me, lead me to exercise my heart with faith and love and exercise my spirit. Lord, teach me, train me, not just how to do, but to do. Train me to do this in every situation that will come about. And I know from the past, all kinds of things have happened and will. Uh, surely the Lord will gladly perfect all of us. And this brings us to the last section Daily, we should labor on Christ to have a surplus, a harvest to bring to the church meetings for the corporate worship of God the Father. And so this again is portrayed, or I say again, it's portrayed by the people of Israel when they met together at the feasts. They were not allowed to come empty-handed. There was a harvest and there was a surplus more than they needed. And the best part of this surplus, this harvest, they brought for the worship of God corporately. And this is a picture of the genuine Christian meetings. The saints, before they come to any meeting, labor on Christ, produce something of Christ, and bring that Christ to the meeting. Then there is the corporate worship of God the Father. From the worshipers he's been seeking. Well, I know I personally and thousands of others like us, I haven't been 
in a person-to-person church meeting for a year and a half. But we meet by Zoom. And on the Lord's Day morning, I don't want to get into how the brothers described the meeting. But just reflect upon your personal history in the church with meetings. Maybe just reflect upon the last five years or so. What have the meetings been like? What has the Lord's Table meeting been like? Mainly singing hymns, songs, praying over them. Oh, there is such a deep longing in God's heart. They have meetings filled with the Christ we have produced in our labor that week. The life in the land is a land full of the enjoyment of Christ, both personally and collectively for the Lord's people. The life in the good land is a life of laboring on Christ, producing Christ, enjoying Christ, sharing Christ with others, and offering Christ to God that he may enjoy him with us. My brothers and sisters, my fellow believers and disciples, I ask you to try to reflect a little. When was the last time in a meeting you offered the Christ you experienced and enjoyed. You offered to God for his enjoyment. You just knew when you prayed. He didn't just repeat a line from the hymn. Something was welling up in you and you just wanted to worship the Father. And spontaneously, you just said, Lord, Father, oh, I just worship you with the forbearance of Christ, with the faithfulness of Christ. This is my Christ I bring to you. You are offering that to God, but at the same time, everyone else in the meeting is partaking of that. When someone else would pray, mentioning another aspect of Christ, their Christ. How God the Father is longing for this. And as one of his children, just like you, I also long to be in such meetings. One under B, this kind of enjoying and sharing is an exhibiting of Christ to the entire universe. Our meetings are being watched by the angels of God, by the enemy, by the evil powers in the air. And if we are exhibiting Christ, we will be exhibiting Christ to the entire universe. What a Christ, not only what Christ is in himself, what he is in his people. And look at this expression of Christ. And this worship of God, this is real worship of God and a shame to the enemy that there are such people on the earth who don't come on a Lord's Day, others call it Sunday, and have a formal, ritualistic kind of worship. Everything predictable. 
No, it's living, it's vital. The produce of Christ is brought to the meeting, offered to God, shared among the saints. C, may we be diligent to labor on Christ, to have our hands filled with him, and then come to the church meetings to enjoy this rich and glorious Christ with God's children and with God himself. Oh, there's a prayer underlying this point. Lord, Lord, make us diligent to labor on you. Lord, from now on, will we never again come to a meeting with empty hands, nothing of Christ produced this week. Rather, Lord, <clears throat> we have our hands <clears throat> filled with you. And now we are here corporately to share together this rich and glorious Christ. But this is now the time in the meeting to worship God the Father. And now, Father, we like to offer to you the Christ we have produced. This will be very, very different from turning from the time in the meeting, Lord's table, remembering the Lord to worship the Father. We sing one hymn, and then a leading brother stands up and says, wasn't that a wonderful meeting? The meeting's over now. I have seen this happen. I'm not an elder. I've seen this happen more than once. When will our Father God have the desire of his heart for true worshipers and real worship? When will he be satisfied? How much longer must he wait? And now the last section. Whenever we come to the Lord's table meeting to remember the Lord, and worship the Father. We should not come with our hands empty. We must come with our hands full of the produce of Christ. Okay, whenever, all the time, in any kind of situation, if we're still meeting on Zoom, this is part of the whenever. We're meeting with some saints. We're meeting with God. We remember the Lord by praising him. We worship the Father. But are we empty? And so, if we didn't sing a hymn, what would we say? What would we pray? Lord, Lord, have mercy on all of us, that we would really labor on you and come to meetings bearing you for the saints and for God. One, to worship God with Christ is to worship him collectively with all the children of God by enjoying Christ with one another and with God. Enjoying Christ with one another. Enjoying Christ with God. We need to produce enough of Christ so that there will be a surplus to share with others and offer the best part of the produce, produce to God the Father for his joy, delight, and satisfaction. 
I want to repeat this. We need to produce enough of Christ, not just enough to somehow keep us alive spiritually. Oh, we, we made it through the week, but I just had enough to get through. But we need the surplus enough so that there will be a surplus, not for us individually. It's not all for us personally. It's to share with others. And then we offer the best part of this produce to God the Father for his joy for his delight and for his satisfaction. I remember going back decades of reaching the end of an evening, Lord's Table, Lord's Supper meeting in Los Angeles. And there was true worship of the Father and we just had the sense God was satisfied. He was delighted. He was joyful. And many, many saints testified our Mondays were among the best days of the week, not Friday, but Monday, because of the overflow from such a corporate worship and enjoyment of Christ with God. Well, I don't want to live in the past. I don't want to live in memories. The Lord has gone on in the last decades upon decades. But now the Lord is speaking to us, I believe. Maybe he's saying something like this. I redeemed you. I became a curse on the cross for you so that I, as the life-giving spirit, may be the reality of the good land to you. I need you to labor on me, exercising your heart and your spirit, to produce me, to experience me, to enjoy me, and to have a surplus, not for you, but for all the other brothers and sisters, and the best part, for God, my Father. Sooner or later, Lord, and I say sooner or later, saints, sorry, not to the Lord, sooner or later, saints, God, our Father, will have his joy delight, and satisfaction. Why not begin to produce this now? This conference, the message part, is over. But this conference is not simply an event on a Labor Day weekend. We're here under the Lord's ministry and his shepherding and care. And what was spoken that is pleasing to him and what we have heard and received, may this be the basis for us to go on in a way we've never known before of really experiencing and enjoying the all-inclusive Christ for the fulfillment of the desire of God's heart. Lord, we simply offer ourselves to you again as a living sacrifice. We lay our hands on you as the burnt offering. You are the meal offering, peace offering, sin offering, trespass offering, 
And Lord, we pray that from now until we finish the end of our course, our daily life will contribute to the fulfillment of God's purpose and God's economy. Lord, we need your shepherding, your healing, your directing, your teaching, your training. Lord, as your slave, and in your name, I'd like to bring to you in prayer all the saints who have heard this message and who may hear it later, all of them to you, beloved brothers and sisters. Take every one of them on step by step and day by day. Train them, train us all to labor on you as the good land. And may we never come again empty-handed to a Lord's table meeting, but we will come with the produce to share with one another and to offer to God. Lord, you are hearing. I believe you will answer this prayer. Answer it not so that we will feel successful, but that God will be satisfied and glorified and that the enemy will be put to shame and the way will be opened for you, dear Lord, to come back as our bridegroom. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen.